to female persuasion, a conversation on women-led cults. Put your hands together, and please welcome to the stage, podcaster and author Tori Telfer, and podcaster and true crime trivia show MC Rebecca Sebastian. City. Thanks for being here. Thank you to whatever female persuaded you to come here. Um, my name is Rebecca Sebastian. I am the host of Yellow Tape, a true crime trivia show, and also the podcast Dialogue, where we examine and explore true crime as a genre. And my lovely co-host this evening. Hi, everyone. We're so glad you're here. We were not nervous that no one would come, but there were times. <laughs> oh, it's great to see you all. I'm Tori Telfer. I'm the author of Lady Killers, Deadly Women Throughout History, which is a book on female serial killers. And my podcast is Criminal Broads. <laughs> my podcast is Criminal Broads, <laughs> which is about sort of the same thing. And I'm, curl I'm about to turn in a book on con women, which you'll be able to buy next summer, I think. Um, so we're going to get started with a round of cult-themed trivia, led by Rebecca, because she's the expert. Yeah, we thought we would ease our way into the women-centric cults. Uh, I think you're going to learn some new names and some new stories tonight, but we thought, let's start with some cult classics, if you will, <laughs> and uh, see what you guys know. This is going to be very informal, so if you know it, shout it out, and we're playing for prizes. Every single question has a prize, if you get it right. If you don't get it right, someone else has the right to jump in. So we can't see you that well, so we're gonna have like an honor system here. Um, so without further ado, the first question. It's gonna be on the screen and I'm gonna read it so I don't know where to look, okay. And this is the prize, the little note. Oh, the end is nigh. <laughs> because it's funny, because it's true. <laughs> okay, what is the name of the cult? There we go, that David Koresh led. Oh, you, someone's got, you gotta be bold. She sees the person. Branch Davidians is correct. And there is a visual of some Branch Davidians. So you get the end is nine. Let's cheer for her. She put herself out there. She got it right. Well done. This is exactly how it works. You guys are doing great. We're gonna do a little bit of this now, by the way, and a little bit later, just so you know. Next question. In 1978, Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple, led 918 people. Okay. Wow, I didn't know who we were playing with tonight. Looks like it was you. And you just won this bottle of arsenic. Don't worry, it's empty. Totally a Halloween decoration. They were out of cyanide, sorry. For anyone who didn't hear, it's Guyana. She's right. That's the country where that happened. Okay, this is moving quick because you guys are good. So the third and final question before we get into the female-centric cult stuff that you came into, and you're playing for Lady Killers, and this is an advanced copy by Tori Telfer, and it's a great book. If you want to know more than you cared to or thought you needed to about female serial killers, this is the read for you. And your question, what celebrity, what celebrity brothers were raised in the Children of God cult led by David Burke? Jonas Brothers. <laughs> we heard it over here. It's not the Jonas Brothers, it's the Phoenix Brothers. Although, are we sure about them? I'm not. Uh, how heartbreaking is that picture? Such cuties. Okay, so that's how we play Yellow Tape, a true crime trivia show. You guys should come find us. I'm usually playing at QED Astoria. There's going to be more of that where later in the show. But for now, we're going to ease right into the, shall we say, educational portion of the evening. Professor Telfer is going to just kind of lay some groundwork for us, and we're going to go to Female Cold Beaters 101. So without further ado, it's all you, and you're going to have this. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. I want to tell you all a little bit about female cult leaders in general, but first I thought we should start even more general. What is a cult leader? You, you kind of know it when you see it, but there actually is a definition. So first of all, a cult 
is, again, you know it if you see it, a little bit subjective, but most people agree it's a small religious group that's not part of a larger, more accepted religion that has beliefs that many consider extreme or dangerous. Now, a cult obviously has to have a cult leader. A cult leader has to be alive. And academics, scholars, journalists kind of agree that there are three things that make up a cult leader. So the first is a living, charismatic leader who is the source of all power, all authority, no accountability, right? The second thing, a cult leader is someone who persuades or coerces or brainwashes his or her followers into doing things that are not in their best interest. Again, these are all negative things, but that's the role of cult leaders. And the third thing uh, that characterizes a cult leader is they exploit their followers. That can be economically, that can be sexually, often it's both, all of the above, right? Um, some other things you should know about cult leaders, <laughs> they tend to have very shady finances. They, oh, I forgot I can. They tend to have very shady finances. Where's their money coming from? We don't really know. Uh, they tend to be paranoid. They love to talk about being persecuted, being uh, that conspiracy theories are happening against them, that the end times is coming. They love the end times, of course. Um, they have no tolerance for questions. Don't you dare question their absolute authority, right? If you leave the cult, they're gonna, they're gonna backstab you. <laughs> they're gonna say that you're evil. They're gonna tell all the other followers that you're a terrible person. Um, and they're utter narcissists. So, something like this. This is Jim Jones. He's sort of the touchstone of cult leaders, I think, in a lot of our minds, because he checks every single box in the cult leader handbook. Um, look at him just loving the adoration. So when you Google, say, famous cult leaders, here's what you get. A lot of men. A lot of men. Yes, like uh, serial killers and CEOs and U.S. presidents. <laughs> cult leaders tend to be male, or at least we think they are. Um, you know, we could probably talk about why that is all night. I think a big reason is that most humans are un still unwilling to give absolute authority to a woman, right? And cult leaders demand absolute authority above all else. Um, but you'd be surprised how many female cult leaders there are. Like, I thought I knew female cult leaders. And then I started researching for this event. There are so many more than I knew. I'm not saying there are thousands. I'm not even saying there are hundreds. But I feel like a lot of people think there are three, maybe. <laughs> Two to three. I would argue there's maybe 50 to 100. <laughs> but don't quote me on that number. Um, oh wait, I missed a slide. <laughs> this, this is my image for cult leaders being male. <laughs> AKA big mood. <laughs> no, I don't know. Um, so anyway, there are more female cult leaders than you know, but less than there are male. And I am saddened slash happy to report that female cult leaders are not necessarily a different breed than their male counterparts. It's not like, well, male cult leaders are really powerful and evil. Female cult leaders are actually really sweet and nurturing. Uh, no, female cult leaders are just as manipulative, charismatic, power hungry, deadly, and evil as the men. And they're totally fine with murdering you. <laughs> you probably recognize this lass. <laughs> Ma Nan Sheila from Wild Wild Country. Um, she is sort of a shero of some of us, but also she's completely down to kill you. <laughs> um, so before I tell you about a couple real other female cult leaders, I had one other like broad point to make. Who joins a cult? Idiots, right? Sheeple. <laughs> Definitely not people like me and you. <laughs> cult followers, um, I'll be honest, they get a bad rap in the press, right? Especially when they do bad things. And the fact that they often wear matching outfits doesn't help. <laughs> that being said, it's very easy to be unsympathetic to cult followers uh, and to think that we would never find ourselves in their shoes. But I think it's important to remember that cult leaders, if there's anything they're good at, it's finding followers. Cult leaders are so good at identifying the type of people who will fit into their particular creepy little obsessive cult. Um, I mean, that's, that's their job description, pretty much. 
Um, cult leaders tend to target people who are new to an area, who are lonely, who have recently experienced loss, and who are questioners, you know, seekers, people who want to find answers. Um, you might say that type of person sounds totally pathetic, but I gotta say that sort of describes me. I just moved to New York not too long ago, had a loss in my family this year, always looking for answers, <laughs> always. Um, you know, I like to think that I would see a cult leader coming my way like 50 miles in the distance, but I don't know, you know? So, um, oh, and then the other thing is no one thinks they're joining a cult, right? You think you're joining like a small group or like a church, um, maybe a social justice organization? Because a lot of cult leaders will use these very positive things that we all probably stand for to lure us in. So social justice, a lot of humanitarian talk, you know, like feed the hungry, care for the poor, and then before you know it, they're coercing you and you're not allowed to talk to your family anymore. And then you're wearing pastels. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's all on cults in general. Let's get to the ladies. <laughs> yeah, girls. These ladies have broken the glass ceilings of the cult world. And that's not really that good. Because they did a lot of horrible things. Okay, our first girl, this lovely lady in millennial pink. I would say Anne Hamilton Byrne is perhaps the most famous female cult leader. Does anyone agree? Yeah. Like, yeah. Some, some of you have heard of her, right? Definitely not as famous as Manson or Jim Jones or David Koresh. Um, Anne Hamilton Byrne was a Australian cult leader in the 60s and 70s who had a cult called The Family. And <laughs> she, she uh, not to be confused with Manson's family, and you know, she said she was the reincarnation of Jesus. In order to convince people of this, she doused them or dosed them with LSD. She said you had to have a blue, an all blue room in your house where you would go to worship her. She herself loved facelifts. She loved blonde wigs. That is probably a wig. That's a facelift. <laughs> Sorry, but um, she was very vain. She loved money. And she loved being a mother. <laughs> she <laughs> scream and keep screaming. It is real. <laughs> she saw herself as like this ultimate mother figure, you know, kind of an earth goddess, blah, blah, blah. So what she would do is she would have her followers, many of whom worked in hospitals, illegally adopt children. Um, and she would dye their hair the same, dress them in matching clothes, walk around with them. There's her just leading her little flock. She had like three times that many children. Um, but then she would abuse them or allow her followers to, to abuse them because she wasn't around that much. And when they turned 14, she would douse, dose them with LSD too, to initiate them. And the sad ending of this story is that she was uh, prosecuted for like a couple minor crimes, but never did any significant jail time. And then she got dementia, and that meant in Australia that her children could never prosecute her, bring charges against her, because she couldn't, uh, you know, stand trial. And she actually died this year at the age of 97. All right. This next woman, you've probably heard of her cult, if you haven't heard of her. Who, who's, what cult is it? Heaven's Gate. Yeah. <laughs> so Bonnie Nettles is the lesser known female behind Heaven's Gate, um, a famous cult. Her part, not romantically, but her co-founder, partner, was Marshall Applewhite who is far more famous, but he would admit that Bonnie was the brains behind the operation. He was just the mouthpiece, he said. Um, they were sort of your typical, I don't, I don't even really know what they believed. Something about transcending to a higher plane, aliens, something. Um, and they called themselves the two, or guinea and pig, or bow and peep, or doe and tea. Bonnie died of natural causes before she could ascend to a higher plane, but 12 years later, Marshall and 38 of their followers followed her by killing themselves. Oh, sorry. It's her and Marshall. All right, this is a bit of a controversial one. Um, 
Because some people don't think she's a cult leader. <laughs> but I'm taking a stance. <laughs> no. Um, so this lady uh, is maybe a cult leader, maybe just a really successful businesswoman. She is the owner of Loving Hut. Um, a very large chain of vegan restaurants, the biggest vegan restaurant chain in the world. And she seems okay. Like, she doesn't ask her followers to drink poison. Uh, she doesn't ask them to disown the bars low. She doesn't ask them to disown her fa their families. But she asks them to call her supreme master. She says she's as great as Buddha. And her finances are shady, which, as we know, is kind of a cult leader thing. So I'm including her because. I feel like in 50 years, we might look back and be like, a little culty. We might, we might look back and be like, oh, it's so rude that we all thought she was a cult leader. She was just advocating a plant-based diet, which is great for the environment. <laughs> or we might look back and be like, wow, that vegan thing was a great front for a horrible cult. Um, you just never know with organizations that have people demanding you call them supreme master. All right. this. Uh, esoteric looking lass is <laughs> Ma Jaya Sati Bhavagati. Um, don't be fooled by her name. If you read her obituary in 2012, you'd probably think she was pretty great. Uh, she was a humanitarian, an author, and an artist. And her, her slogan was, there are no throwaway people. It's beautiful, right? Um, unfortunately, she, well, first of all, she was a white Jewish girl from Brooklyn named Joyce. <laughs> I just noticed her Brooklyn necklace. So, like, don't be deceived by, you know, how she presented herself. And um, she did your typical I am God or I am greater than God, sort of decided one day that that was her shtick. Uh, started an ashram in an isolated part of Florida. Isolation is a theme that comes up again and again with these cults. And at the ashram, you know, she was doing these kind of Mother Teresa-esque things, ministering, blah, 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 world peace, blah, blah. She dies, and her followers are like, oh, you guys, <laughs> you have no idea what was really going on at that isolated ranch in Florida. Um, they claim that there was extortion, forgery, abuse, forced marriages, and pedophilia. And her own daughter came forward and said that at 14, she was raped on the command of her mother. So I'm including her because this is a good example of how often cults use social justice, humanitarianism to disguise you know, a very sinister core. All right, this is the only photo we have of uh, this woman. Sachiko Eto is kind of an indie cult leader. I, don't, I feel like no one's probably heard of her. Any chance anyone has? I hadn't heard of her until recently. Um, she was a Japanese woman who sold makeup door to door in the 90s until she decided that she was God, again. <laughs> I know, it's just like one day, wait, you know who I really am? <laughs> How do you get to that point of confidence? Um, she decided she was God, got some followers, told them to move into her house, again, isolating. And uh, her thing was performing exorcisms. Now, like so many other cult leaders, if you peel away the veneer of religion or whatever, humanitarianism, you find a very, um, you find that their motivations are very personal. Sachiko wasn't doing exorcisms because she was trying to help people achieve transcendence. She was mad at this one girl because this girl was allegedly sleeping with her lover. So she decided that the girl needed to have the demons beaten out of her with drumsticks, and the girl died. And Sachiko and her followers did this five more times, beating the life out of six people and then putting their bodies in a random room in the house and just thinking that that was going to be okay. Um, she was arrested, thankfully, and charged. And in 2012, she was hung in Japan, the first woman in 15 years to be executed there. All right, this fun broad is Valentina. Oh gosh, uh, she was a cult leader in the 80s, big decade for cults. Her thing was, well, first of all, she lived in a remote Brazilian town in the middle of the Amazon. And she told people that um, they would be saved by UFOs coming to save everyone. I mean, just them. Not everyone, but just them, because Valentina could talk to the aliens. But 
She said that the aliens had some bad news. Um, they said that every male born after 1981, so that is some of you, that is some of you in this room, was evil. Uh, had to be killed. Had to be killed, otherwise could, we can't go up in the spaceship. So, so that's what they did. They kidnapped, tortured, and killed 19 poor boys. I know. Two of them escaped and testified against them. Uh, a couple of Valentina's followers were given long sentences, but Valentina got away because um, of her alibi, which was, I just wasn't in town when the murders happened. So, she was never punished. It's about to get worse, then it'll get a little bit better. <laughs> Has anyone heard of her? All right, this is Credonia Murinde. She killed at least double Jim Jones' body count. But who's heard of her? You can get Jim Jones' face on a t-shirt. You can literally get Jim Jones' face on a t-shirt. I have yet to see her face on any article of clothing. I'm not saying it should be, because she is horrible. But I'm just saying, okay, so Credonia was, in the 90s, a bar owner and potentially a sex worker in Uganda. And then she gave herself kind of a Mary Magdalene to Virgin Mary makeover. And she was like, I'm pure now, and I am the leader of a cult called the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. Yeah, simple, straight to the point. She claimed that the world would end in, pick a year, what year do you think, in the 90s? Yes, 2000. That beloved year of cult leaders everywhere. And she collected thousands of followers. Now, her followers were poor. They were hungry, you know, and here comes Credonia giving them hope. And also saying, oh, you should just give me your money and property because the world is about to end and you're not going to need that in the afterlife. So her followers give over everything they own. She keeps them weak by telling them to fast, um, by making them do physical labor, making them sleep on the ground. And when the world didn't end, when the world didn't end in 2000, and her followers were like, could we please have our money back? <laughs> Credonia could have given it back. She could have run out of town. Um, but she decided to kill everyone. So she started by poisoning a lot of people, uh, including children. She then had her men um, garrot them, crush their skulls, shoot, knife, stab, whatever, bury in mass graves, and then she had those men killed and burned with acid, to, you know, covering her tracks so no one would ever know. And then when she was down to a mere 600 followers, she invited them into her little church, and she nailed the doors and windows shut, and she burned the whole thing down. In fact, this only photo I have of her, if you Google her, you will see photos of the burned bodies. So don't do that. Um, but it's very, it's pretty recent, um, and her death count, I mean, we don't really know, but it's at least, you know, 1,500, probably more. Um, and she got away. She vanished. She could still be alive today. No one knows where she is. And the last thing I'll say about her is that people always said she's very, very beautiful, but that she never smiled. <laughs> All right, a little bit lighter. <laughs> Here's my girl May Otis Blackburn. She's a... Uh, cult leader from the 20s, so like Charleston, Gatsby, and May's cult, which she ran with her daughter. That's her daughter. Uh, it was called the Divine Order of the Rorm of the Great Eleven. <laughs> you probably all remember that. I don't know what the Great Eleven are, but um, she is a colorful figure. Let me tell you just a couple things she did. First of all, she said they were waiting for Jesus to be resurrected and for this random 16-year-old girl to be resurrected because May made the fatal error of this 16-year-old girl and her cult died. May was like, she's definitely about to be resurrected. Then she had to preserve the body on ice for a really long time to keep up appearances. And sometimes she would put this poor girl's body in the back of her car and drive around Los Angeles. If her cult leaders were getting a little bit bored with those antics, she would put on a purple robe and kill mules. When she was 60, she married a 29-year-old, sassy, um, but he had five-inch long fingernails. Possibly the most disturbing detail of the night. Just imagine him. Um, and my favorite, least favorite, 
detail of May is that when one of her followers got sick, she decided that the solution was to bake the woman in an oven. So she put her follower in an oven, and two days later, the woman died. Well, <laughs> she took her out of the oven, and I don't know how many degrees. I think it was a slow bake. <laughs> Like, it, she didn't burn the woman, she just like warmed her to an unhealthy degree, and then two days later the woman died. You're all horrible for laughing. And this is just casually like one of her followers with lion's head that they call, I think, the source of living light or something. Whatever. Alright, and last but not least, this is just an old school one I'm including. Uh, a friendly lady wrote a wait, wait, from the 1500s, uh, no, from the 1850s in Connecticut. Um, her thing was, well, first of all, she might have murdered her abusive husband. Then, I know, we're not mad about that. But then she flipped it and reversed it and started giving sermons where she said, he murdered me and I am talking to you from beyond the grave. <laughs> So that was her thing, it was like, I'm dead, but giving sermons. But sometimes she flipped that and said, I'm not dead, um, but if I die, the world is going to end in a second, so you all better keep me alive. So her followers were very few, but very fanatical. They were called the Wakemanites. And um, one day when she said, uh, that guy has a demon in him and the demon's trying to kill me, they all decided to beat the guy, beat the demon out of him. The guy agreed. He was like, I don't want to kill Rhoda. I don't want the world to end. Um, and they beat him until he died. And then Rhoda went to jail for the rest of her life. Um, here's a little newspaper. The New Haven Murder. A new revelation. Um, when Rhoda died in 1859, the world did not, in fact, end. So that's just a little taste of the wide variety of female cult leaders out there for your viewing horror. I'm going to pass the mic over to Rebecca who's going to dive more deeply into a cult with a lot of women in it. That was quite a ride. Yeah. <laughs> we, didn't, um, we didn't share our content with one another for the most part, so um, I was right there with you guys. That is crazy. Humor and laughing at these things is a coping mechanism, so don't feel too bad. It's like we don't know what to do with the, that kind of trauma and stress. Um, I can't wait to tell you. So I'm going to deep dive into one specific cult, and I'm very excited to do so. But first I want to ask you a couple of questions. <sighs> Let's take this out for a sec. Um, I'm going to ask them, and I actually want you to answer them, but you don't have to do it out loud. Just kind of to yourself, but be honest and, you know, dig deep, if you will. Because I'm curious if any of you have ever felt stuck, just professionally or personally, just kind of looking around at your life like, is this it? Like, a soul crutching job? Is it back with friends? Is there more? I want you to know you're not alone. And I'm so glad you're here tonight, because I want to share a ground floor opportunity. Okay, obviously I'm just kidding. And I saw some of you get nervous, some of you got it, some of you didn't. Um, but I want to illustrate to Tori's earlier point, cult members are seekers, and they're asking a lot of universal questions that we actually all do feel, right? We do ask the questions of why, and what are we here for, and I think I'm meant to do more. And the cult I want to tell you about, oh my gosh, we're going to talk about the women of a very recent, very relevant, very local cult. Their headquarters were right upstate in Albany. There was a trial in a nearby borough of Brooklyn. Some of you might be guessing right now what I'm doing, and if you guess Nexium, you're right. So, some of you are going, West Nexium? You'll find out. And the others are saying, wait a minute, Nexium, isn't that guy associated? Yes, him, Keith Ranieri. He is the face, he is the name that we know and associate with Nexium. But let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you about four women without whom this guy, you would not know him and you would not know Nexium. Because apparently, from hearing Tori's talk too, I'm thinking, I think behind every deranged, <laughs> maniacal male cult leader is a really bright, smart, <laughs> badass, horribly misguided woman. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about them. But before we do, you kind of have to understand Nexium, which is no easy task and we don't have 
days, like a five day intensive, which is where you would go and spend $5,000 to learn about Nexium. But here's a little unofficial timeline I made. So in 1998, Keith Ranieri formed um, a program with his friend Nancy Salzman, more on her later. And it was called Executive Success Program. Corporate, boring. They called it ESP more casually. And it was just your typical run of the mill late 90s kind of jargon, self help, new age meets kind of corporate practicality. And people would buy them <laughs> in hopes of improving their work life, their personal life. And people did. I mean, this was the late 90s. There was the internet, but it was not, it was early days. So no LinkedIn, no verification. People took them at their word. They bought these classes and they kept building. In the early 2000s, they were like, we should rebrand. We need a sexier name. So, because ESP and executive success program is pretty boring. So they came up with Nexium, which is a, and I don't know if they knew, but it's a heartburn medication. And they <laughs> decided inexplicably to spell it in a Latin way, even though there's no Latin root or meaning. And Nexium was born. Now, this is the time when it kind of got interesting because Keith started, and Nancy, assigning some sort of new aspects to the cult. It wasn't really officially cult then, but it was. So they started talking about gender and the way men and women are different. And they noticed by and large that it was mostly women showing up to the courses and taking the courses. Men did do it and they were participants, but it was mostly women. And they kept hearing three themes in women's lives that they were struggling with. Their food, like diet and their body issues, sex and relationships, and work. So he started kind of imbuing the curriculum with these ideas of female empowerment through subjugation, essentially. Becoming a slave to one man in order to reach your best female potential and power. And I guess women were just tired and like, okay, you know, maybe that is the solution. I'm exhausted. I don't know. But people bought into it. So that was happening. He was also developing very romantic relationships with a lot of the women, and he was openly polyamorous, kind of before that was a thing, or a thing we talk about at least. And But the women had to be monogamous only with him. And if they were part of his training facilities in any capacity, that included their partners or husbands. Um, so just with him. So we don't want to talk too much about him, right? We want to know about the women. But one thing you should also know is he required, like any good cult leader, he referred to himself as vanguard and, regard, and required others do the same. Okay, so that's a bit about where Nexium was going, but things got really weird in 2015 because now there's like 30,000 people taking these classes all over the country, and that's critical mass. So there's going to be these subsets and smaller groups, and the women within Nexium, the most passionate, kind of zealous, um, high-ranking officials, because you also move up the ranks in Nexium, right? You take a course, you move on, and then you get other people to join, and you become a leader. So these women were like, we want more, and we want something more kind of extreme. So they came up with a DOS, which actually is Latin. It means, um, or it stands for Dominus Obsequius Sororium, loosely translated as master over slave. So Keith Raniere would be the kind of headmaster and the women would be slaves under him. However, the women who recruited more women in would be masters over that woman. And the pitch, if you will, to other women was, I'm gonna be like the best version of you. Like, you're gonna be my slave, and I'm your best self. And it was like this weird mirroring kind of thing. Okay, so that's Doss. So that's a little lay of the land of what was going on. And then, we're going to talk about the players and how this came to be. This headquarters. I mean, I know it's a black and white photo, but would you buy anything <laughs> that people in that office were putting out? Um, okay. Nancy Salzman was the co-founder, as you might remember from early on. So she was Kate's friend and his equal and his peer, and she was very smart. She was a psychiatric nurse. And she was trained in hypnotherapy, so her specialty was sort of stripping people of their hang-ups and their fears and their limiting beliefs, and then building them back up. And I think Keith saw in her the perfect complement to his like self-professed, it was delusional, but he thought he had the Einstein IQ, all that stuff. So he said, together we could really you know, do some amazing things and people will believe you and you're credible. So that's kind of how she became a leader. She was unaware of DOS, the secret cult, because she did invite her daughter Lauren to join Nexium. More on Lauren in a minute. I like to think she actually didn't know about DOS, because if she did, then 
awkward. Um, so her charges ended up being racketeering and racketeering conspiracy. And I do have a definition of racketeering because it's a very old, tiny word, and I didn't know what it meant. So I'm going to read that. Okay, so it's dishonest and fraudulent business dealings. Early examples would mean drug trafficking, smuggling of weapons, kidnapping. More uh, modern versions might be human trafficking, bribery, wire fraud, identity theft, and money laundering. So if I would assign her a role in Nexium, it was the ultimate defender. Uh, people were thinking Nexium was getting weird, and people were talking about it. And she was on the front lines just shutting it all down. And she would do that in criminal ways. She would fudge the books, falsify documents, delete emails, and any questioners she would shut down and keep people siloed from their families, from their friends, and their communities so that they could limit the amount of detractors. And they did use the word detractors, but insist it wasn't a cult. That's Nancy. Um, I should say, every woman I'm going to talk to you about has pled out um, guilty. They've pled guilty to most charges, and they're all awaiting sentencing. Keith is the only one who stood trial. That happened this July. He actually pled not guilty to all seven charges and uh, is awaiting sentencing as well. So just um, maybe one more difference between men and women, I suppose. Uh, Clara Bronfman, the name might be familiar because she is the granddaughter to the Seagram Alcohol and Spirits Fortune. So she brought in, if she had a role in Nexium, it was the bankroll. Like, she funded up to $65 million of her family's fortune to keep this going. But it wasn't like, I mean, you saw their headquarters. It was not their office space. She was paying for lawyers. They had a lot of lawsuits, a lot of unhappy customers. For every, like, Nexium cult member that was, like, drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak, there were a lot of unhappy people and a lot of lawsuits. She bankrolled the lawyers, kept them on retainer, and fought all the lawsuits. Um, and identity theft. There were a few interesting circumstances around Keith Ranieri's um, ex-girlfriend who died. I don't think he was involved because I'm pretty sure they would have found that at this point. They found everything else. But uh, the board women leaders did continue to use her credit card up to $300,000 after her death. Lauren Salzman, you remember mom, good old mom from before Nancy. This is Lauren. She was like, honey, you got to take these classes. Come on in. Well, Lauren like flew through the ranks of Nexium. She was like a fish to water, took them all, became a leader. They had sashes. They had sashes. I did forgot to mention that. And they claimed they're not a cult. There were colored sashes like denoting, you know, where you were in the uh, in the organization. So Lauren's like loving it. She becomes an executive board member, and she does not claim responsibility for what will become what a lot of us have read in the headlines, which are these branding ceremonies. I'll get to those. But she was an overseer of them. So that is on her, and she also was branded herself. I guess we'll stop and talk about the branding. <laughs> so when you become a member of DOS, you give up something. So if you maybe, let's say I'm in DOS and I want you to be in DOS, I'd be like, you're doing amazing in Nexium. Like, I've heard about you, I've seen your work, and I want, yeah, no, you should be really proud. Um, I don't think, most people don't know, but there's like a little group of us that have been doing this a while, and we're doing something super unconventional, but really cool. And it's pretty badass, but, well, I can't really tell you. And then you might hopefully be like, no, no, tell me. And I'll say, no, you'd ha it's like super top secret. I need to know you're not gonna tell someone else. Well, sure, I won't tell anyone else. No, I need to know. And so basically, that's when the extortion starts. So they ask for collateral. What kind of collateral? Sexual pictures are usually enough, but maybe a videotape of you alleging horrible things against your own parents, or writing documents about sexual abuse that didn't happen and signing it. Those are all very like unsexily stored in a Dropbox folder, and then they have that on you, and they say, if you tell anyone about this, we'll tell you the whole world. So now you're in. You're in DOS. Welcome to DOS. This is also why DOS was a very small subset of Nexium. Okay, so there's thousands of people in Nexium. There's like 24 in DOS. So it was small, but it was passionate, and it culminated in a ritual called, I think they called it a commitment ceremony. The women didn't know they were going to be branded. They were told it was going to be sort of like a demarcation tattoo kind of night, like a BFF tattoo thing. And when they got there, they were told to get naked and to go on a table, and they had to say the words, it would be my honor to be branded and wear it for the rest of my life. 
Now, why would they do it? Well, because they have all that collateral, and they're also bought in at that point. So that's what DOS was, and that's what Lauren was overseeing. Also, in addition to that, she, she admits, I want to get quote right, she, <laughs> she admits to concealing and harboring an undocumented immigrant for financial gain and fraudulent use of identification. Now we're talking about cult leaders tonight and not the victims. We should give her her own night, but this was a woman who dared to express interest in another man besides Keith Ranieri, and she was locked in a room and made to do administrative menial tasks for the organization. And that is just a fact. Lauren has admitted to it, and that's one of her. And I think because she's giving up a lot, they're not um, they're not going to sentence her based on that part. Fourth and finally, Allison Mack. You might recognize her face. Anybody watch Smallville? I haven't either, but she's a TV star. I haven't. I mean, I've heard of it. I know it's about Superman. But um, what's so perplexing is she is actually Keith Ranieri's right-hand woman. She's the second in command. And she found Nexium like most other people. She had had a successful acting career, but it was kind of slowing down. And she was reaching that age where she was wondering what to do with her life in this time of transition. And she found Nexium, and she just took it all in and became like a zealot for it became very close to Keith Ranieri, and interestingly, is the only one with sex trafficking charges against her, um, because she was the one who came up with DOS and the branding ritual. So, it's really hard for me to even know how to talk about it, because frankly, I wonder if she isn't like, if she's the case of a victim becoming a victimizer, and I think that's up for debate, but I thought it might help us if we saw an exchange between her and Keith himself, Keith loved YouTube. He has a lot of YouTube videos still up there and out there, should you want to hear about authenticity, true beauty. Um, here's a snippet of them talking, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on just your response. But somehow you, you reach into their very essence, and you, you meet a unique individual. I don't know why that makes me want to cry. It's beautiful. I think, oh, it's, sorry. The, I think these are all things that we we strive for. You know, we strive as a as individuals. We strive to break through a type of existential isolation. We want to touch someone. We want we want to know that other people have souls. We want to experience this. We want to experience connection. Things that, uh, things like what we call love um, and compassion. And, even something like, uh, as I say, connection or rapport. Mm -hmm. Some people call it an energy or whatever, but now we're not talking to a machine, we're talking to another human. And even if that human is a machine, somehow we do <laughs> it with the, we even ask the question, is this, is this thing alive? Is this it's thing like he's alive? a parody of himself. <laughs> <laughs> Why, why do you think it's so emotional for me? Yes. I don't know, I think because it seems like it's a, something that I just, I feel like I want it. Um, authenticity, and I, and I, I think... What I mean, do you want about authenticity? I think that there's a, a relaxed kind of exchange that happens between people when there's no pretense. Mm -hmm. And it seems like to me those are like the most moving, most meaningful, most important moments in, what? in life. I'm not disagreeing with you. Why? Then, yeah, it's funny. I mean, it feels like in a silly way. It's like that's where love is. Like that's where like two. I guess it's the existential thing. Like it feels like two souls can like come together okay. without any sort of. I can't. Okay, it's the existential thing. That's cringeworthy and hard to watch, but you can see she's bought in. I mean, I, I didn't watch Smallville, like I said, I don't know, maybe she's an amazing actress. I think she, I mean, look, that says it all. Like, she's brainwashed, but she really does become a perpetrator of power. I think she was looking for answers as a seeker and became powerful in it. And I guess that's tempting and a human frailty. Um, okay, so... If anybody's squeamish, this one's going to be hard, and you might not want to look, but I think it actually, I'm not doing it for shock value, but to show kind of the real trauma around the branding, um, 
These are some of the women's marks. So they were told it was an abstract symbol representing mountains and air. Upon closer inspection, it would seem it's actually Keith Raniere and Alice and Max initials. Um, at least that's what they're saying in court. So really traumatic and um, not a laughing matter. Uh, she's pled not guilty to the charges of of uh, sex trafficking, but guilty to everything else, and um, feels really bad about it all, she said. <laughs> so whatever she was looking for, I think she found, and then some. But um, again, I struggle with her as victim or perpetrator. So what happened? How did they all end up in court? They got exposed, and it's because this woman, Sarah Edmondson, an actress from Canada, spoke out. She called the New York Times. She got branded, and she's like, this is not what I signed up for. And she went through with it because she felt she had to. And then she blew the whistle on them. And that's when the FBI started probing. And it was just months later that a huge raid happened. But not before Keith said, like, they started losing followers, right? Like a big story like this is never good. So attendance, membership, it's all dwindling. And he was getting nervous. And he's like, we need a recommitment ceremony, like with all the most like loyal women. And they went to Mexico to have one. And that's where they got raided. So <laughs> this is him being carried away in a police car. And when the police pounded on the door, Lauren Salzman said, the police are here, what do you want me to do? But she looked around and Keith was nowhere to be found. He was in the closet, hiding. It was the women that opened the door, that spoke with the FBI and the Mexican authorities. Everything he taught us was this, what men do, what women do. And then he didn't do it. I did it. That was Lauren. So. Stay tuned for early 2020 where all their sentencing will happen. Um, I think they're going to throw the book at Keith Raniere. I'm curious what they're going to do with Allison Mack and the rest of the women. But that is the women of Nexium. So now, Tori's going to tell you about a, a loco cuckoo bird. Oh, you don't need the mic. You need this. And then we're going to play some more trivia. Um, hello again. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. That was great, Rebecca. I didn't know most of that, and that's horrifying. Um, all right, I'm going to tell you, I must admit some human frailty myself. Um, I've already done a podcast about this woman, and I've already written an article about her. So the fact that I'm still talking about her, I may be the crazy one. But I have kind of a personal vendetta against her. We've emailed several times, and she will not do an interview with me. So I'm kind of mad about that. <laughs> but um, I'm, she'll respond, but then when I say what I'm about, you know, she won't respond anymore. And um, I think that she is a very, she's a good example of how certain things, in her case, the wellness industry, um, vague spirituality, and just general, like, women stuff, can seem harmless or good or silly or whatever, um, but can be used to hide something very sinister. So she really gets under my skin. That's why I'm still talking about her. Uh, I'm going to play a little clip of her talking first so you can just get to know her. Do I need to press it? Hello, everybody. This is Jasmine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking forward to being in Buenos Aires in Argentina at the end of November. Over the last few years, we have discovered so much about the magnificence of the human design as people all over the world, through the practice of a very particular lifestyle, are going into deeper and deeper states of revelation and union with their pure nature. Mm. <laughs> I love how she's like, Buenos Aires. <laughs> um, we'll get into, what does she call it, the specific kind of lifestyle? We'll get into that. Um, but, okay, this is Jasmine Pee, my nemesis. <laughs> Jasmine was born Ellen Grieve uh, to Norwegian parents who had emigrated to Australia. She, uh, I, I don't have her birth date, but she's she's a cool 60-something these days. Um, she says that 
as a child, she felt very lonely and isolated. She was Norwegian, everyone else was Australian. And while other kids were playing with toys, um, she was into esoteric philosophies. So, you know, the teachings of the greats. Um, she felt isolated, different than other kids. Um, as a young woman, she tried to find herself, like we've all done. She studied art for a while, she dabbled in the hippie movement, she got married, had a kid, got divorced. By the early 90s, she had a high-powered job in finance, and so she kind of got a taste for the good life. She had money. Uh, she had a nice big house and like multiple nannies for her children, and was living some, someone's dream. I don't know if it was her dream, but in 1992, she lost her job. Uh, so again, she sort of had to pivot and redefine herself. So she was like, huh, I've been into esoteric philosophies since I was a child. <laughs> Maybe I'll try that. So um, she decided to sort of rebrand as a guru. And in 1993, she told the world, or whoever was listening, that she had received a message from the spirits. And the message was simple. It was, stop eating. So Jasmine Heen is now identifying as a breatharian. That's how she says it. She did not invent breatharianism. Maybe some of you have heard of it from the groans I'm hearing from the audience. Um, it is, you know, um, a, I don't even want to call it a diet, but it's, you know, if you're, if you're vegan, you don't eat animal products. If you're a breatharian, you don't eat anything. You live on air. Some people say the crystals in the air, the energy in the air, the prana in the air, the pranic energy. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can praise it. Um, but you live off the pure air, and that's it. Now, Jasmine didn't invent this. There are a lot of breatharians, and their history is, shall we say, wild. <laughs> Some other time I'll tell you a story of the breatharian American dude who was caught coming out of KFC with a big bag of chicken. <laughs> he was a wily something. Fitting. <laughs> um, so, you know, she didn't invent that, and of course, fasting has a long, rich history in a lot of religious traditions, and now sort of in the wellness industry, um, but fasting is going to be broken at some point. That's where we get the word breakfast, right? You break your fast. Breatharian is never going to be broken, or that's what these people say. You're, you never eat again. Um, there's no breaking of the fast. So, um, so anyway, if Jasmine had decided that she was a breatharian and that was just her thing, who cares? Whatever. Um, but she decided that she was a guru and she started spreading her message. And she got hundreds of followers and then thousands of followers all around the globe. People were sort of surprised by how successful she was. She published a book called Living on Light, <laughs> the source of nourishment for the new millennium. I don't know what this is. Oh, she changed, she changed her name from Ellen to Jasmine Heen, by the way. Um, and in this book, she lays out her signature 21-day fast, which is how you train yourself to become a breatharian. You go from you, your disgusting, food-eating self, and over the course of 20 days, you become like Jasmine Heen. Now obviously, she's blonde, she's thin, she's pretty. Her message is appealing to a lot of people, which I know is like hard to understand, like with all these stories, um, but something about her is appealing to people. So at first, the, you know, the media in Australia catches wind of her, and they kind of think she's funny. Because if, that, if Jasmine Heen's good for one thing, she's good for some wacky quotes. And she's totally happy to talk about her lifestyle. Um, she will talk about her bowel movements, or lack thereof, because she doesn't eat. <laughs> she she will tell people, she'll tell journalists that she she's feeling a little naughty. She'll have a bite of cheesecake or a little nibble of chocolate <laughs> just to taste it. Um, and then she'll have, I'm sorry, but rabbit type droppings. <laughs> you know, but other than that, she doesn't need anything, whatever. So the media kind of loves this. I mean, it's good to like throw her up on a TV channel or like interview for her for an article because she'll say stuff like that. A journalist even goes to her house and is like, Jasmine Heen, 
Your refrigerator is literally full of food. <laughs> and your cutting board has clearly been used recently. And there's an entire shelf of vegan supplements and powders. And Jasmine, he's just like, what? That's for my husband. <laughs> She's very slippery. You know, she always has a little circular reasoning quote to slither out of things. Um, she is preaching not only this 21 day fast, but she's also saying that, to be honest guys, um, we could cure world hunger if we would all become breatharians. <laughs> but the reason children are starving of malnutrition is because they don't know how to meditate properly. She has a quote on her website that reads, every second second a child dies from hunger related disease. This is unnecessary. And a group of dedicated, tough, well-trained, self-selected warriors, known also as the Knights of Camelot, <laughs> have been utilizing themselves as guinea pigs to prove that human beings do not need food to live. Her websites, plural, <laughs> are full of quotes like that. Um, and she would say that if you became like her and stopped eating, you could not only look forward to things like more energy, um, a certain glow, uh, but you definitely wouldn't get cancer you'd have a better sex life, and your food bills would be lower. That was one of her talking points. Your food bills would be lower, and there would be no more world hunger. So um, before we move forward, I want us to suspend our skepticism for a moment. I think about why Jasmine Heen might appeal. I mean, first of all, what she's saying is medically horrendous, and you will die if you don't eat. And you will certainly die sooner if you don't drink, because she also said she didn't drink water. Just sometimes a cup of tea. A little cup of tea. Um, but if you strip away the silly, you know, Knights of Camelot, and the babble, and the video where she has, what was behind her, snowflakes, or like cherry blossoms, if you ignore the aesthetics, which are obviously um, goofy, they're, she has an appealing message at her core. What she's saying is, it's kind of gross to be a human. We're in these, you know, meat sacks that are sweating and shitting and secreting oil. Think about that we secrete oil from our pores. Ugh, like it's kind of, and you know, we have to, we have to eat to live. And, and this is, you know, a Nexium parallel, women with issues about food. It's we have to eat to live and then we have so many loathings, you know. It's like oh, carbs, sugar, we just have so much nonsense about food. And Jasmine Heen is saying basically like, here's a way to become pure, to really transcend all that gross human stuff. She's not really preaching weight loss, like that wasn't really in her rhetoric. It's It's a more like spiritual, wouldn't you like to just get over all that disgusting bodily function stuff and become this pure creature? And again, it is medically disastrous. But you can kind of see, uh, if you empathize with her followers for a minute, how that could appeal to some people, right? It's kind of like, as, as with all cults, you know, they're preaching this message of like becoming a better version of yourself, etc. So, it's not that surprising to me that she has all these followers, even though it is very sad. And um, so anyway, she's like in the media, and the media loves her. And then every time a doctor is asked about her, though, they're like, oh my god, no, no, this is not right. Everything she's saying is false. Uh, and Jasmine Heen, with her circular reasoning and her voice that you heard, she loves, she'll be like, like people will say, so, you know, that's scientifically incorrect, and she'll say, according to your science, <laughs> but not according to mine. She loves that little pivot. It's like, your reality, but not mine. Your science, but not mine. Anyway, um, doctors are saying this woman is dangerous because if you do this, if you stop eating and drinking, you will die. And it wasn't long before people did start to die. So the first death that we can link to Jasmine Heen happened in uh, 1997. Um, and her, this guy was a 31-year-old kindergarten teacher from Munich named Timo Deegan. So her message is really spreading around the globe. She's in Australia. Um, and he finds her many websites, which are, many of them are purple. Why do cult leaders like purple? Yeah, power color. 
Hmm, royalty? Yeah. What was that? It's a royalty. Yeah, royalty power. Yeah, so her websites are purple and there's like stars in the background, of course. Timo finds her websites and likes the idea of sort of put it, casting off the drudgery of food, Jasmine Heen's words, and becoming a better person. So he starts her 21 day fast. And let's see what, what happens. Uh, okay, his vision starts to fail. His circulatory system starts to fail. Uh, he falls into a coma when he is taken to the hospital. One nurse later told the press she thought he looked like a concentration camp victim. Um, he gets out of the coma for one second, falls, hits his head, and dies. So that's 97. 98 comes, another victim. Lainey Morris is a 53-year-old Australian woman who wants to reinvent herself, finds Jasmine Heen's book, decides to do the fast, and she basically like finds this couple who say they're breatharians, and she lives, or she isolates herself in, the, in this little, um, what's it called, thing in their backyard, trailer kind of thing, <coughs> and they're gonna like leave her alone. And for 21 days. Her plan is to drink orange juice for the first seven and then, you know, nothing. And she keeps a diary. It's heartbreaking. It is full of thoughts of food. One day she writes, every morning I think of cups of Earl Grey tea. Yesterday I caught myself reminiscing over tomato and coriander soup. Today it is black forest cake and pancakes with maple syrup and ice cream and hot chocolate with marshmallow. She's not writing about food, she's hating her body. Uh, one day she writes, breasts smaller, wish it was my stomach. Her right side becomes paralyzed. She begins vomiting black liquid. The couple watching her say that, oh, you're ridding your body of toxins, and they don't call the doctor. Her vision goes, uh, and she dies of dehydration, pneumonia, kidney failure, and a severe stroke. And the last entry in her diary it's not words, it's a spiral. The drawing of a spiral. Is that not the most morbid thing? The next year, 1999, a third person dies who can pretty much be directly linked to Jasmine Heen. Um, I don't have a picture of the other victims, but I have a picture of her. Isn't she so cute? So this is Verity Lynn. She's Australian too. And it's 1999, so what's coming? The millennium. <laughs> Time to get your shit in order. I love New Year's resolutions, so I can only imagine. I don't remember making any, because I think I was too scared of Y2K. But if you like making New Year's resolutions, just imagine like making your millennium resolutions. So Verity was obviously one of those people. She likes to self-improve. She likes to make resolutions. Um, she decides she finds Jasmine Hughes writings. She finds the fast guideline, whatever, and she decides that she wants to become spiritually cleansed for the new millennium. So she goes on a solo trip to Scotland with a copy of Jasmine Heen's book, and she camps uh, alone in the Scottish moors, and her body is found, um, you know, far from her tent. She's clearly, like, entered some sort of delusional state, crawled out, um, and is found curled in the fetal position with her jacket, like she started to take off her clothes because she died of hypothermia, you know how you think you're hot at the end? So she, her jacket's up like this. She died of hypothermia, dehydration, and this is from the report, and self-neglect. And uh, there was a copy of Jasmine Heen's book discovered in her possessions. So now we have three deaths linked to Jasmine Heen. The, this last death, when this happened, a journalist went back and found the others. So. No one had really been writing about this yet. Um, Jasmine Heen is confronted, and she is shockingly callous. She's basically like, I didn't know them. She says that she and Verity didn't have a connection. She says that Lainey Morris, uh, the one who died vomiting black liquid, um, she said Lainey hadn't come from a place of integrity and did not have the right motivation. And she basically said, in her ja slippery Jasmine Heen rhetoric, that she was just putting information out there and what you did with that information was up to you. She wasn't the boss of you. She never said she was the boss of you, right? She was writing on her website, publishing books about fasts, and if you followed that, you know, that was your responsibility. Um, so, basically what happened is, 
the media stopped laughing and started being like, what is happening <laughs> with this woman? And so they were like, okay, if it's not your responsibility, you need to prove to us that you can practice what you preach. You need to prove to us that you, that you truly don't eat. Otherwise, you're evil. <laughs> but can you truly live on nothing but air? So the Australian show, 60 Minutes, um, they decided they were going to film Jasmine Heen 24-7 for seven days and seven nights and, you know, see if she ate or drank. Weirdly, Jasmine Heen agrees to this because I think she's a delusional, you know, maybe believes herself. I don't, I don't know. I know she eats, so I don't think she can believe herself, but she agreed to this. Maybe she thought she could do it for seven days. Um, and here's a little clip. So for, this is her exercise. <laughs> Miss Jasmine is merely the latest in a colorful line of new age carpet bags. Except her message is dangerous and she's deluded. Jasmine actually believes she can live without food or water. In fact, when we suggested a test, without hesitation, she agreed. Do you have to relock you up for seven days and watch you die? You want to watch me die, I'd come out smiling and laughing, it'd be a holiday. But you're happy that we lock you up for seven days? Can we do it somewhere really beachy and yummy? Um, lock you up inside. Oh, no problem. No problem. Okay, I don't know if you, I don't know if you could hear that, but he's like, are you gonna, are you okay with us watching you die? And she's like, you wouldn't watch me die, I'd come out smiling. And then she goes, can we do it somewhere beachy and yummy? It's like, okay, Jasmine, calm down. So, um, you, I, if you want to know more, just find this clip on YouTube. It's under Ratharian Fail. <laughs> um, but basically what happens is they film her for three days. She starts fading. So she says, um, I live off prana in the air and we are in the city. So the pollution is killing me. <clears throat> Can we do it somewhere beachy and yummy? So they move her to the country. There's this clip of her walking around her new like country estate, like, oh, <laughs> this is so much better. Um, and the show has a doctor on hand because we, we've got to have some science in here. And um, basically, by day four, the doctor examines her. Jasmine is slurring her speech. Her pulse is very high. Her blood pressure is very low. She's lost about 13 pounds, and the doctor is saying, like, she's going to die. She's going to die if we continue. Jasmuheen, of course, is slurring and looks crazed, but she's saying that she feels fine. The doctor says, like, you're dehydrated. You haven't peed. Sorry that I'm talking about body functions, but this is Jasmuheen's thing. The doctor's like, you haven't peed, and Jasmuheen goes, that's not true. I went four times today. <laughs> and she's just like... You mean you've never seen such denial? She says she's feeling fine. She goes, my mouth is still moist. Um, so anyway, it, it turned out kind of good for Jasmine Heen because basically what happened is 60 Minutes canceled it because they were afraid she was going to die. And you can't have people dying on your show, right? For legal reasons. Um, so they canceled it after four days on um, the advice of the doctor. So Jasmine Heen got to be like, I would have done it. You know, I totally would have done the whole seven days. Um, and immediately after the show was canceled, she emailed out a press release with her signature circular reasoning. One line was, what appears to be a delusion to some is simply a preferable reality to others. For without our dreams and vision, humanity has no hope. <laughs> so today, Jasmine's still kicking. And she checks her email. <laughs> emails, she probably has 50, um, she's kind of covered her tracks because now she says that the 21 day fast is too intense for people. She says it only succeeds 10% of the time, so she doesn't technically recommend it anymore. Um, instead, you can buy her new book, Food of The Food of the Gods, available on Amazon for $18.95, and it has a gentler fast, more suited for mere mortals like you. Um, and she I think is still making a lot of money. She sells little like meditations, she sells little songs you can buy on iTunes, although I wouldn't. She's very active on Facebook and sometimes she posts poetry. Uh, my favorite line of hers is, uh, I walk this earth as the goddess I am, alive and so free, 
enjoying life's jam. <laughs> I almost had a heart attack just then. Enjoying life's jam. <laughs> um, but to be, to be serious, she, um, her 21 day fast is still out there and you can still find it. And that means it still has power. You know, you can still buy her book, you can still find her preachings. Oh, she doesn't, you know, recommend them anymore or whatever, but they're still out there on the internet. Um, when I did my podcast episode about her, I hashtagged the post on Instagram. I think I hashtagged it Jazz Muheen and Breatharian. And some of her followers found me. They were all very nice. Um, but they were followers. They were like, She's the real deal. You just don't know. You know, she, this lifestyle is achievable. And just a few years ago, actually, um, a Swedish woman in her 50s found the book and found the fast and decided she wanted to be cleansed. She wanted to be pure. She wanted to transcend. And um, she started doing the fast and she took it so seriously that she would even spit out her own saliva Aww. instead of swallow it. Her children were very worried, and she said, it's okay, it's okay, if it, if it gets too bad, you know, I'll stop it, I promise. Um, but one day, she didn't answer the phone, and her children went to her house and kicked down the front door and found her dead of starvation inside. And as with all the other deaths, Jasmine Heen refused to take any responsibility. This is just Jasmine Heen these days. You don't have to read all that, but it's a little prayer she's reading. <laughs> In purple. Biosystem recording, blah, 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 blah. Biosystem, feed yourself directly from source essence energy now. <laughs> That's Josh Muheen, guys. just because the aesthetic was for thin women. So it was much more shallow, but interesting that they restricted calories as well. We have a little bit of time to play three more questions of True Crime Trivia. We have three more amazing prizes. Um, is this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, someone's going home with a 21 day fast book tonight. <laughs> Is this the next one or the next next one? It's that one. You're right. So Tori's going to show you. This is amazing. It's a spooky typewriter, and if you wouldn't mind, yeah, it's a skeleton. And what you can't see is that words come up on the paper, and it says it was a dark and stormy night. So I know one of you really wants this in your house. And if you answer this question right, you can get it. Uh, let's see. Though not as large as, we talked about it tonight, as Jonestown, in terms of number of victims, this cult also perpetuated a mass suicide in 1997. Which cult? I saw her hand and she said it. Is that cool? Did you say someone else? No, I just screamed yelling. Okay, yes. You. White t-shirt? I just said Heaven's Gate. You're right. You get the creepy typewriter. And now we're going to give away... This is a kind of like, if you know, you know kind of prize. It's a Karen candle from My Favorite Murder. Um, she's a true crime icon, and it's just like a scent candle. So I'm going to give that to Tori. And if you know this question, shout it out so you can win that candle. Oh, there's Heaven's Gate. There's a, well, yeah. We've got the purples, we've got the UFO, we've got the sad um, aftermath right there. 1997 was not that long ago. Some of us graduated high school that year. <laughs> uh, some of us weren't born. <laughs> okay, oh yeah, here's just the Heavenscape website is live. I just wanted to show you that. <laughs> yeah, this is on here and um, they have a position against suicide and it's on their website. Um, so I, maybe part two of this talk will be just page by page going through their website. Uh, okay. For the candle, wait, this is for the candle? Yeah. Which cult engaged in a practice of recruiting? Oh yeah, we're gonna give a try. I'm gonna read the question for everyone else who doesn't know as much about children of that cult. Which cult engaged in a practice of recruiting new members by sending women members out to have sex with them? Something they called flirty fishing. Totally normal. This is um, the literature that David Berg created. He was an artiste. 
And um, he did ask people to call him Moses, and this was just one of, these were like comic books. So kids in the cult read these, and they were like indoctrinated into these practices. So this was like totally normal if you were in the Children of God. And this goes back to the other question, the uh, Joaquin and River Phoenix. It was this cult. Um, okay, last question, and probably my favorite cult question of all time, and the prize is a big deal. It is two tickets to Madame Morbid's trolley tour in New York City. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. A haunted trolley tour. So you're going to get two tickets, um, and you just want to see Tori after you food wine. So this one we have to be on guard. I'm going to count you as the person who gets it. Um, you're looking for the person, because I'm going to be focused on telling, asking the question. What famous musician took a genuine interest in Charlie Manson's musical aspirations? Is that you? And that was Brian Wilson? You are correct. She's correct. So talk to Tori after, and you too maybe are going on a haunted trolley tour. You guys, we're going to um, close tonight out with a little, do we have, should we do the musical interlude and then? Yeah, so I want to share. So sincerely, the Beach Boys and Brian Wilson, as she so aptly answered, um, really thought Charlie Manson was talented. And something we didn't talk about tonight was kind of the misguided talent of cult leaders. I mean, they do have charisma, as you mentioned. People, they could draw a crowd, right, at the very least. And I like to think maybe Charlie Manson, if he'd been more successful musically, could have found that adoration and what he was looking for in another way. But um, yeah, so here's, I mean, that's interesting. Dennis Wilson and Charlie Manson, they met hitchhiking. And Char uh, Brian Wilson was totally on board having him become part of their musical scene, but Charlie pulled a knife on their producer, and he was like, all right, dude, this is over. You're on your own. But um, I do have a couple of songs. If we could play the first one. Charlie Manson wrote this song that the Beach Boys played. This is called, as released by the Beach Boys, Never Learn Not to Love. It's kind of sweet. The for a Beach Boys song, a little more on the like low-key, melancholy, but low-key side. So Charlie Manson actually wrote this song that the Beach Boys released. But if you go down a rabbit hole, you can find the Charlie Manson version and share it with people. So <laughs> can we hear that one? This is Charlie's version. Just come and say you love me. When the Beach Boys released it, they called it Never Learn Not to Love. The official title by Charlie Manson yeah, ceased to exist. <laughs> Different tone. Marketing department next step. But in my opinion, it's more interesting. It's kind of better. Am I right? And they only give you 30 seconds on uh, Murderpedia, so that's all we got tonight. This has been Female Persuasion. Thank you so much. Stories if you have them. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you so much. Yeah.